wasn't really intended to evaluate for telescope. The idea was to try to compare data between some different systems. And um, what I wound up getting, I had my data from my 1.2, and I received some data from some of the other members, uh, two at uh, 3.7 meter dishes and one from a uh, 2.7. And the drift scans were approximately the same. They were 24 hour drift scans at a round declination of plus 40 degrees. And each scan or file was between four and five minutes, one to one and a quarter degrees. So the, the acquisition was, was similar. Um, what was interesting is that two of the systems used Spectra Cybers, with which I was not familiar, and the others used uh, some more current uh, SDRs. So here are some of the, the differences. This is with mine, and uh, I think I have the greatest uh, noise to uh, H1 amplitude because I have the I'm using a fairly deep dish that shields the antenna from ground noise pickup. But as you will see, compared to the others, because the beam width is wide, so is the uh, both the spatial resolution and also the ability to resolve small variations in frequency, aka Doppler shift. Uh, but the, the obviously with the SDR, all frequencies are simultaneously acquired. So a 300 second scan allows 300 seconds of data to be acquired and average for each frequency channel providing good statistical convergence, smoothing. And this is interesting because the spectra cyber is different. It took me a while to figure this out, but the spectra cyber is a step frequency scanner spectrometer. It's if you set up a sample integration time of one second, each channel takes one second to be acquired. So if you're sampling 280 frequency channels, it requires 280 seconds, but it's only one second per individual frequency. Um, the other thing is the amplitude scales. The spectra cyber scales everything in volts, which is supposed to be related to power, but I've not been able to quantify it. So I scaled these plots in in volts, and but the amplitude uh, I was not able to to co compare to the SDR system. Uh, let's go to the next slide, where this is data from the 2.7 this is 3.7 meter dish on the Spectra Cybers. Um, you can see here that the uh, the signal to noise ratio is is much lower than was with the SDR, and that's because you're only looking at every frequency for one second. It takes the same roughly three minutes of time, but you're not getting good signal noise ratio only because of the short duration period of the samples. And uh, there's not a whole lot of great, there's not a whole lot of difference between the 2.7 and the, and the 3.7 meter dish, but you can see a lot more definition in both the spatial resolution and in the, uh, being able to resolve Doppler shift frequencies. And then the next is the 3.7 with the SDR. And you can see that the narrower beam width of the 3.7 meter dish allows you to resolve great, much greater spatial details. Same thing, 300 seconds with an SDR is 300 seconds of data, good statistical convergence. and Gets a nice resolution, and um, in in both uh, spatial resolution and in frequency. And so, comparing mine with the 1.2 with the 3.7, this is approximately the the half power beam widths of these two uh, antennas overlay basically the same area of sky. You can see the dramatic difference in detail. And, and the, the smearing because of the beam width being wider, that there's sort of a, a blurring of the image between the two. But so this started out just seeing if I could read other people's data, and it turned out to uh, being an interesting study in comparing 
uh, data between the uh, SPECTA cybers and uh, SDRs. Questions? Questions? Am I still online? Yeah, you are. Yep. You're good. Um, and, uh, hello. Uh, go, go ahead, Wolfgang. Alex, I appreciate yeah. all the data you're collecting. This is neat because now we can actually have something to compare with. So I appreciate all your work. Um, Alex, have you been able to determine uh, the, let's call the signal to noise ratio on a quantitative level? So what it essentially should show uh, somehow the radiometer equation. So uh, you're having much less integration time per channel, obviously the, the, uh, for the spectra cyber, um, so the noise will go up. Um, so essentially, um, it's, uh, I believe what you said is one, two, uh, 300. So 300 seconds integration time with the SDR and one second integration time per channel for the, uh, uh, for the uh, spectra cyber. So in principle, let's, let's say it's a factor of 300. So the signal to noise ratio uh, would be the square root of that, so it's around a factor of 17. Uh, could you determine that or see so, it, that it was in the neighborhood? Well, see, the problem is I need someone to put in a, a couple uh, attenuators in the signal line in, in the RF path that I can convert this, these power numbers to, to a, a decibel scale. That's the problem. I have, I just, uh, I normalized everything to one. These are scaled from about one to five to one point one from one to five, but I, I can't correlate this to a power. And so uh, I had differences here of like uh, 2.7 dB to cold sky. I have no idea how to do that with these numbers. Uh, well, uh, Alex, I think one of the assumptions that you can make with respect to um, the spectra cyber, which obviously is an assumption, but if it was built at a certain time, uh, when SDRs were not available, so you could not do the simultaneous collection of, of the channels. But the typical way you did it was you had your scanning receiver and you measured the power by a uh, square, square law detector. And a square law detector will give you a voltage that is uh, proportional to the power. So the voltage could be directly converted. So it's equivalent to power. I think this is a it's a working assumption, but I think it's a, the most likely uh, assumption that you would make because people would be using square law detectors. But what would I do? I don't know what I would do with this data, Wolfgang. I have numbers that go from one, one to five, or it could go. It would be zero yeah. to four. I don't know how to equate that to the, the calibrated EV values that I can get from an SDR. Well, my obvious comment uh, at the beginning would get rid of dB, but <laughs> that's, yeah, that's something we discussed yeah. before. No, the, the point is that you have a voltage uh, which yeah. the spectra cyber delivers, and that is proportional to a power. So it's twice the voltage, it's twice the power, which also means it's 3 dB. I, I think the other, the other problem with spectra cyber is that you can uh, change the gain, which would give you a different voltage for your measurement. Yeah, so, but it wouldn't change the relation. I mean, you, you're always looking at relations. So well, essentially the, the, the background of my question was the signal to noise ratio. So you can determine the noise, uh, RMS noise, and compare that to the peak, no matter what the scale uh, is. Okay, okay, I could do that. No, what you're saying yeah. is make a measurement exactly. from here of the RMS to the peak. Yeah, the RMS to the peak, and if you take the voltage, that would be RMS power to the peak power. Okay, then I can then and, I can convert dB back to power. And, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. That's, and, yeah. I, it's, that. I mean, it's 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 sort of a academic exercise, but it would be interesting uh, as a good demonstration that a scanning spectrometer has a disadvantage, as you have explained, that you're you're measuring one frequency at a time. And in, in fact, the back of the envelope calculation gives you that you have an improvement of a factor of 17 in signal to noise ratio if you go to a SDR, which is substantial. I mean, this is really a big difference. 
it was an interesting study. And I, I, what was interesting is I didn't anticipate I could get this level of comparison. And it was, it was great. It had two, two antennas or two systems using the uh, Spectra Cyber and two using SDRs. And, and different, different size uh, dishes uh, was a pretty good comparison of performance. Okay, uh, just one one comment. Of course, uh, when you compare those and you compare signal to noise, of course the um, the system temperature of the different uh, devices will play a role. So it it would not be just the the radio meter equation, but other things as well. But really, the, as you have pointed out, or you can really seen from the data, the uh, the dominating improvement in signal to noise in this case is really using SDRs rather than a scanning device. Uh, I'd like to comment the uh, gain uncertainty on uh, you know, receivers, be they SDRs in the front end hardware, preamps, uh, uh, you know, Spectra Cyber, or almost any other receiver. The gain is uh, uh, something that you don't have super accurate control of. And if you take a look at, uh, you know, like Green Bank, uh, uh, every radio telescope up there will have a directional coupler with a very low coupling factor, typically like minus 30 dB put in series with the antenna line and there's a noise source hooked to the coupler. So when you turn the noise source on, you get a definite step and level of a known number of Kelvin, uh, like the 40 foot telescope up uh, there in uh, Green Bank, which uh, yeah, we get to use when we're there. Uh, uh, the calibration source, I think is about 11 or 12 degrees Kelvin is added to the receiver when you, you know, push this button. So now if your detector is truly square law, then you can calibrate out any power, you know, based on that. Uh, of course, you saw the factor of the antenna size and the, you know, Kelvin per Jansky, but at least you can establish the number of Kelvin that a source uh, represents coming out of your receiver. Then if you know the scale factor for the antenna, you can, you know, of course, get it to uh, Jansky's at absolute level. And then they also go to known sources and take readings, right? Uh, constantly to compare against. Uh, that's true. That is another method used. Although if you look at their receiver lab up there, you'll see everything has a directional coupler and the noise source in there. Way that you can just add a very small amount of noise on top of your received signal for, you know, and observe that step. And now I have a known calibration. And he's and Alex is doing a drift scan though, so he can't jump over to a known source and do a calibration. But maybe there's something else outside the Milky Way arms that uh, could become a, a reference that people could use. I don't know if you ever drift drift through some other known source. <clears throat> well, I was pleased that I could get some past data from several different people at Correlate. Trying to do a team project would be a, much more of a challenge. And also I'd point out that even though the Spectra Cyber is only integrating for one second, depending on the A to D that's used there, that could be a lot of samples that were taken uh, in that one second period. But the number of, I think the number of samples that you take in that one second uh, doesn't have any any effect on the signal to noise ratio. As, I mean, this, this, typically your signal to noise ratio would be determined uh, by the, of course, the the signal or the the system temperature of your of your system, and then you, the integration time, and the integration time is just much shorter if you use a scanning receiver. It's a, it's a time, the integration time as part of the uh, radio meter equation. So if you cut down the integration time, that's what you're losing in terms of signal to noise. It is just one, one second integration time. Okay, anybody else got any questions for Alex? No. All right. Uh, let's see who else online. Bob, how's your antenna farm going? Uh, things are going fairly well here. Got a lot of a lot of different uh, projects uh, relating to that. I'm mostly right now lately focused on the positioner that I obtained. 
that would allow me to move a dish around and uh, maybe join Dimitri and, and uh, do other things with it. I have spent some time on uh, software and things trying to get one of the new RTL uh, SDRs to work and still haven't got that resolved. And uh, I'm off uh, doing some other software projects too for another, uh, for this board for AMSAT that I'm trying to work through. And uh, also for uh, looking at the uh, super SID data. So I have a lot of software type things that are bogging me down right now too. But um, that's what I've been up to. All right, question for Bob? No, okay, uh, Helen. No, I, I don't have anything been out of it for the last um, uh, two, three weeks, but I'll get back on track. Um, we have family, close family in um, Lewiston, Maine, and what happened there kind of affected everybody. So everybody's nerves are pretty much fried right now, but um, get back into everything. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Uh, Wendy. Wendy, are you there? Okay, and we got Vanessa. Vanessa, you're, I think you're new to this group. Hi, um, basically I did the same stuff as Wolfgang since we worked together. So nothing new for me. Okay. Uh, Let's see, uh, Nathan. Oh, hey, uh, yeah, I'm working on a couple of things. I haven't finished up anything yet, but I'm getting close. Uh, got my first pyramid scan uh, telescope working. It's about to finish up its first hydrogen scan, about 85% of the way done with that. So putting that through Ezra and learning how Ezra works and uh, trying to do some of the shoes stuff as well put that data up there so uh maybe uh help ted out with some of the smaller scopes um working on a uh, second scope now of the one meter no electric uh dish with the custom cantana and uh just trying to get it working i'm not having great results just yet um we had a, a put on i made a uh a cantana and it seemed to kind of work and then i tried to make the six inch uh cake pan type with the uh single loop 21 centimeter loop and uh didn't have really great results with that uh don't know if it's spillover picking up something from the back uh may have some grounding issues i'm not really sure how that's working so just kind of plugging away back and forth and seeing what works and what doesn't work uh, but pretty soon I'll be working on adding the uh, aluminum mesh up over the sides to kind of shield some of that uh, background background noise. So hopefully I get some better results off of it. Nathan, I do know on the um, on the cake pan dish, if uh, depending on what which ones you're using, if you're using the ones with fat daddios, that has a hard coat insulation on it, and you mm -hmm. need to scrape off that down to bare aluminum to make good contact as for the feed through of the uh, whatever adapter you're using. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll share my screen here to get this guy out of the way. So that was kind of one of the first things I found was, you have to excuse this, I was just doing a lot of digging around. I did find that, you know, just putting some contact probes on there, it had no conductivity on it. So that's, <laughs> What I did there, took some wire brush on my Dremel and ate away some of this. Um, even ran a screw with the grounding wire down to the antenna. Uh, the one thing I did find is that I think on, on your image, Alex, you showed you had both ends. You had uh, one end of the loop soldered to the male part 
and one to the outside casing for the grounding. And when I do that, I get vastly different results. And it seems like it just. You have to grab that. You have to complete that loop. Yeah, that that's what I was. That's my. So, yeah, that's what I was looking at. And when I ground it. You need to put in a, a small, I think about 18 gauge wire or or pull the center, pull the center conductor out as a RG6 or something like that about an mm -hmm. inch long. Stick that in to the connector and then solder that to the loop. Um, yeah, you've got to close that up. That yeah, has... I know. that's what I was playing around with. That was me cutting it and trying. Okay. I was grounding it and then ungrounding it to see the results. And this is actually when it completes the circuit. This is what I'm kind of seeing, uh, which when I left it, I had it built like this and I let it drift scan for a solid night and I saw nothing. I saw no galactic arms whatsoever. So I'm just, I've also got this weird interference pattern coming in at about 14, 20.8 uh, right. megahertz as well. And I'm just trying to kill all that stuff so I can get some clean measurements. I'm going to recommend you go with SDR sharp and IF average. That way you can get, you can, in two or three minutes, you can evaluate. Change. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where I'm at too. I'm, I'm, trying to work on some of the other SDR software uh, just to see how all of it will uh, yeah, for how all of it plays together. For for initial experiments, you don't want to start taking all night scans. Two or three yeah. minutes, change something, make another measurement. Uh, that's, that's the only way you can get a uh, good mm -hmm. performance. Also, uh, are you using the, the, the paragrid dish that sort of that yep. oval okay yep. it and is i have i spaced mine to within plus or minus a half a centimeter the back of that dish of the cake pan should be right at 35 centimeters above the yeah. uh, okay yeah and i think that's i think i had mine right about 35 centimeters somewhere around there when i was playing with it so uh just getting it kind of started. Uh, I'm about to hit busy season at work. We got budgets and midterm planning and all that other fun stuff. So that'll be my probably my November uh, doing comment. all that, sir. Comment if with the cake pan feed that, of course, although it's a loop, it is a uh, as shown there in the picture. The polarization is just a little off uh, horizontal, uh, and the uh, polarization has to match the grid on the dish. If you get it 90 degrees, you're seeing through the dish instead of, uh, you know, reflection off of it. And uh, that's critical. Alex can probably give you some clues on how to uh, line that up. So so even with this, yes, loop, that's even true. With this loop, that has to be lined up exactly. Yeah, I started off doing that very first thing. At, you're right. This, the... Uh, the, the connector should be in line with the short edge. Right. Oh, oh okay. The okay, short so I need, I need to double check that and make sure that I have that in the right. Yeah, where your arrow now is, that, sh that, that axis should be across the short dimensions of, the, uh, of that paragraph. That's, that's short, and then the other yeah. end, yeah. That should be the long way. Okay. Yep, that's the long way. All right, I can double check that too. If I might make one more suggestion, yes, sir. start with the sun. Start with the sun. Get a get a good hot source, and mm -hmm. uh, you can make your measurements in about five minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the sun because, doesn't give you signal to noise ratio. You can't see cold sky to amplitude. No, no, I understand that, but you're looking at you're looking at the efficiency of the feed at this point, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least tuning the feed, the sun is a nice broadband hot source, <laughs> and um, you can you can tell readily if you have something wrong, like a short in the wrong place or something like that, rather quickly. No, you're right, Alex. Of course, you you need then at, then to proceed, but um, I think for initial testing, the sun is nice. So I also have a, a nano VNA with setting it up and, and 
kind of lining it up so that you get down to the 50 ohm as close as you could or oh. or SWR or something. Oh, that's even better. Go for it. All right. That's probably what I'll play with. That'll tell you that'll tell you quickly uh how good your loop is. Uh, Give me a couple no seconds doubt about about it. it. Give me a couple seconds and I'll show you a, a plot of the VNA. Yeah. While we're doing that, uh, another uh, some... uh, comment on some of the original evaluation of the scope in the box. I did that along with a couple other people. And I had the thing where I was playing with it, had it set up, and suddenly saw an increase in the background noise there and realized my lab assistant, well, the cat that uh, is curious <laughs> about everything, was walking by mostly behind the dish. And I would have thought it was out of the pattern, but that grid dish is uh, not absolutely solid for signal even with the antenna lined up perfect yeah. so that screening that alex has done uh you know based on my you know quick experiment there says uh it that's a very worthwhile thing to do so should i just go ahead and just cover the whole antenna and aluminum screening right now just go ahead and take those take that polarization out of the equation that's what i did all right i've got the aluminum screening here i'll just go ahead and start attaching that but again uh use your use your vna on your loop feed yeah just point pointing the feed at the ceiling or something i mean you you mm -hmm. you can you you want to optimize your match and you want to optimize your uh your vswr mm -hmm. um and then once you've done that you can proceed to diddle with the dish and that you've already you've already said okay i've got the best match i can get on my feed mm -hmm. now let's go for the let's go for putting it on the dish and then optimizing the feed to the dish in other words you, you shouldn't have to diddle the feed to uh optimize the placement of it uh and the signal to noise at least at first order without changing anything on the feed Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, who's got the screen up now? That's mine. It's still yours. So you want to go over that? That looks pretty good plot. Well, so far, this is what I've got off of that first, uh, off the first pyramid, a little styrofoam 0 0.6 me uh, meter pyramid uh, using Ezra and taking the, the my biggest limitation on this is one I'm I'm only doing one drift one day per elevation so I'm not collecting a whole lot of data on this but it is also made out of styrofoam and these Kentucky weather kind of batters it takes it kind of hard to keep it standing upright some days um so I've got it in a good spot now we got good weather so I'm just letting it collect one day per elevation changing about every Two and a half, uh, two and a half degrees per day, uh, but I'm also doing 186,000 uh, samples per integration, so it's a it's about a 50 second integration time. So you get a lot of kind of that smearing kind of pattern. But uh, like you, I've said before, probably online that you know I I studied a little bit of radio astronomy in in college and. This is really me re-educating myself, uh, just getting used to how the new SDRs work and trying to relearn some of the math and some of the science that I've forgotten over the last 20 years. Now we get Rob Lucas and the guys down in Australia to give you that other, the bottom half. Yeah, so I, I put something up there uh, online and I haven't seen it yet, so I'll bug them maybe. Okay, Alex, did you have a picture you wanted to show? By the way, this this is very good. This is a great uh, start. Of course, I haven't found it yet. So <laughs> for a few more minutes, I hopefully I'll find it. All right. Hey, let, let me ask the uh, above the 60 degree mark there. Is that even possible? I mean, it looks like we're just almost the antenna standing no. still. That's, that's, my, that's my 90 degree right there. That's my zenith. 
Okay. And Ted, I don't know if it's it's it worth getting anything uh, above sixty degrees elevation. Um, I'm assuming, to uh, complete the picture, yeah, I think you should. Well, um, who knows what's up there until you go find it? You know, you gotta go to the North Pole. Um, it completes the picture, and it makes the next one with uh, galactic coordinates more complete as well. And so, otherwise, you got a big hole in your plot. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's go to two two over. Yeah. So on the left, there's a hole where the North Pole uh, North Star is, Polaris. Um, I have that same problem. I can't go beyond North. Uh, without scaring myself and so and then he on the right is a hole for where the earth gets in the way very nice uh what's nice about this plot is i see a line largely left right right along the zero line where the galactic plane is you know so it all matches up uh sometimes that doesn't line up if you are not pointing uh, if you're not vertical off the ground and you're leaning to the left or right, uh, this one's pretty close. Nice job. Looking cool. Uh, yeah, we, black lines are the little drift scans. And yeah, here that's, the that's where I had that tilt. That's where I had that tilt that we saw in my scope when I was doing the uh, southern sky. It's as if your telescope is facing south, but yep. you're leaning a little too far over your left foot. You know, you're yep. leaning towards your left ear. Uh, and I can't remember if it's left or right, but uh, it'll show up as kind of a tilt here. Don yeah. has talked about that with uh, old TVRO antennas. Yeah, and that's exactly what I saw when I went out and looked at the scope. I could see it. Well, I saw it beforehand. I just didn't do anything about it. But I was also taking it in and out of the garage all summer because we had horrific storms all summer long. So. I just get a kick out that the, the galaxy can tell you that your antennas are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the um, professionals can tell me. <laughs> um, and, and Ted, uh, we had the one, uh, and I forget his name, uh, actually plotted that and found the, uh, the uh, arms of the galaxy. I don't know if anybody has that picture. That's Andrew over in the yeah. UK. He's uh, doing great stuff too. He's excited about what he's able to achieve. Uh, he really only has two galactic longitudes measured so far. And it isn't it nice that they kind of line up in the right places. Um, we'll see if it continues. So uh, that's the adventure, right? Yeah, that's what I was. This Someone is the one that. that I'm, this is the one I'm really hoping to get. Start, because now you can kind of start seeing some of those, some of those certain arms different arms in different places and then the outer uh, galactic arms are on the bottom those kind of hanging beads uh and then that triangle in the top right turns out to be the inner galactic arms very neat yep um and, rich is the one that pointed to me that, and so when you plot it this way sure enough uh that should be which one is it it's the p uh perseus which is, perseus. Which is, which is nice and bright and beyond that if you move your cursor to the left, yeah, is just a, a faint trace of another arm out there. That's called the outer arm. I like it. Looking great. Now, Andrew had that uh, map uh, tied to that map that showed where. Uh... Yeah, he sh he had his because he, he only he did just a, a small kind of a. Well, he's got two of these angles. And Nathan's been busy. Oh, he overlaid all over the place. He overlaid it with that one, the real map. Yeah, he overlaid it over a different picture. Yeah, that sort of shows it uh, to the uh, the average person. Yeah, I don't think I have. I don't think I have that. But this is the ones that I'm really excited about. I love seeing these. Oops. This is the same as the plot that you provided for us. Uh, rich so long ago this is galactic longitude uh, vertically and horizontally that's all that velocity information velocity, so it's got yeah. a colorful graph on its side uh, quadrant by quadrant yeah, you guys have come a long way from my excel uh, output <laughs> well, the, the, the Ezra really does no pun intended it really does make it easy 
uh, <laughs> it's um, and hopefully I've been finding little ways, hopefully making some improvements here and there, help Ted make some improvements with this. I just got to get more data and get better at collecting data. Uh, Nathan's giving me bug reports. I got to figure out how to handle. Thanks very much. Keep them coming. All you got to do is pull it. That'll be in. So. All right. Okay. Uh, you got any recommendations, uh, Nathan, for the, uh, anybody else who wants to attempt to try this? Um, so I think when I first joined Sarah, Ted and I had a little talk and we talked about the different priorities people, people have, uh, some people like to have a, uh, like to polish their, their antenna. Some people like to get their antenna dirty. I'm do what you like. You know, if you like just taking data and seeing the science and, and trying to figure out what you're looking at, just go out there and do it. Um, it's really amazing what you can build for $50 from Home Depot and a Raspberry Pi. So. All right. This little pyramid antenna that you have, how, approximately how large is it? Uh, it is 0.6 meters across. Uh, and I forgot, it's giving me about 0.36 square meters of uh, area on that thing. Okay. So a longer name would be a pyramidal horn that we're mm -hmm. familiar with, uh, much like the West Virginia folks. Yeah, I think that's what I started with was the WVU rail uh, design and then just kind of went out there and started cutting pieces and made it work. Nice. This is really good stuff. Okay. Um, all right, bales for Nathan. Uh, Richard Flagg, how's that? Hawaii holding up, and did you guys get any uh, radio Jupiter hits on the eclipse? Or uh... Uh, Hawaii is still here, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what to tell you about what was uh, received during the uh, during the eclipse. I did have a, a question for Bruce. Uh, uh, Rich, on your uh, Zoom meetings with Australia, uh, I noticed that their cali one of the calibration schemes they're using is is a noise source and a and a relay at the input of the LNA. And I was wondering if Bruce might be able to have any comments on that compared to using a directional coupler uh, in line with a with a noise source. Which which one is is better way to do your calibration? Okay, I'll throw a couple of comments on that. Uh, first, right now I'm playing around with uh, 20 megahertz uh, watching for solar flares and did manage to catch one little bit of Jupiter, but not a whole lot because I've got a rather limited antenna. But anyway, for uh, the 20 megahertz, uh, you know, well, in my case, it's pull the coax cable off, put it on the noise source. I don't even have a relay there. But uh, for the higher frequency, uh, 408 megahertz stuff, I've all used the directional coupler. That allows you to just add on top. And uh, uh, preamps sometimes change their gain a little bit with source impedance. Whereas and if you're going in with a directional coupler, the uh, uh, change of preamp characteristics from source impedance doesn't happen because the directional coupler is isolating it so much. So the uh, preamp still seeing whatever you know, impedance the antenna is basically with virtually no change from turning the noise on or off. So that can be an advantage uh, in the higher frequencies where you do get more of that effect of the uh, noise figure of the preamp, which is quite low, you know, becoming different because of the uh, source impedance. So that's uh, for directional coupler is definitely uh, preferred for a higher frequency based on that. But for 20 megahertz, like I said, swapping cables has worked good. <laughs> sure. Okay, great point. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right. Thanks, Richard. Uh, let me see. I'm just trying to. Uh, let's see. Robert, Richard, Ed. Hi, everybody. Um, I 
don't have a whole lot to report uh, about my activities. However, I'm also active in um, at the SDR uh, Tapper community. And I wanted to let you know uh, about the uh, a new product that's uh, coming out called the Discovery Dish. I don't know if you've uh, heard about it, but uh, a group called Kraken SDR is going is planning to produce uh, an aluminum uh, parabolic dish at 65 centimeters uh, diameter and the basic electronics, uh, three basic electronic packages. Um, the one of which is uh, uh, tuned directly to hydrogen. And right, yeah, okay, you're on crowd supply. And I, by the way, put up uh, in the chat the uh, link to this page. Um, as you can see, the dish itself is going to be uh, priced at a hundred bucks. And the electronics, which is out on the end uh, at the focal point, uh, is going to be priced at $75. And there are currently three different electronics packages, one of which is tuned directly to hydrogen. Uh, if you go down all the way to the near the bottom, you'll see the three packages. So one is an L-band uh, weather, and then another, another one is the Immersat satellite. And the third one is the hydrogen band. Uh, those are 75 bucks a piece. And then there's a, uh, uh, a packet, a uh, weatherproof package for your electronics. Um, and this, the entire, the dish and the electronics package is designed so that it weighs uh, approximately one kilogram. So you can use really lightweight uh, uh controllers like you're seeing here uh, in order to man uh, uh, to uh, steer the dish. Uh, in any event, I wanted to let you know, I know the Kraken SD, I have, I should say, I have a Kraken SDR uh, based product, uh, not this dish that is, uh, uh, so they, it's a real company and they are producing a, uh, SDR ra radio receivers. And this dish is scheduled for production uh, for release uh, in uh, June, at the end of June. Uh, it, this is done as a uh, crowdsourced uh, project. But, uh, and so I wanted to let you know that this is uh, occurring. Thanks. I can add something to that. Ted, if you scroll up right, right there, um, I've been, exchanging emails with Carl Laufer on this. And uh, the, the advantage of these is that the, the LNA, if you see that little postage stamp square, there's a, there's a two, yep, right in there, there's two LNAs and, and uh, a bandpass filter. The, the LNAs, I don't have the model number right in front of me, but I, I know what that part number is and I did some research. And the, um, the noise, noise figure on those is around 0.3 dB. So they're, they're pretty good. And so being closely, very closely coupled to the feed should give pretty good performance. So I ordered one, but uh, so this is, a, this is an interesting design in that you have it very closely coupled to, to the feed. Well, given the low price of the uh, dish and the free worldwide shipping, those two things don't seem to <laughs> match up too well. The dish, uh, the dish is actually in three parts, and it you you assemble the the parabolic dish after you get it. Uh, they have done that so that they can uh, get the the uh, the lower posted you know, uh, shipping rate, postage rate to get it to you. So what are the three parts? There's the big dish and what, the stick coming out? And no, maybe there's three, the there's, there, apparently there are three pie-shaped por portions. I believe that the picture here is actually a prototype. 
Sure. Okay. And so we get three pedals. Yeah, three pedals, right. We're all, that we're all confused is. about the pattern in this prototype, but okay. It, you know, it must be sending some signal or something. <laughs> well, if anybody gets this thing, let's uh, see if we want to shift uh, from the uh, scope in the box antenna to this thing uh, as our offering. Uh, so let me know. Uh, right, thanks. Further down in here, there's a. Uh, uh, someplace in here, I saw a comparison in, uh, in the thing. The, one of the big advantages of this is the weight is way down so that you can use a, uh, a lower grade uh, 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 steering uh, device. The, the, the uh, November. There it is. Uh, the comparisons. Yeah, the no, no, the November QST. I got to get it in here. Has a little thing for tracking satellites, and it looks exactly like that picture. And it uses two uh, reasonably heavy duty. Um, what do you call them? Servos, uh, model servos. Right. And it's got a complete list of things to do. To hook it up, and I think the uh, total cost of that was about a hundred dollars. So you're looking at about a hundred bucks for a feed, and it's a servo feed which could be run by a little Arduino Uno, which Rich has already hooked up to uh, years ago, a few years ago. To uh, didn't you hook it up to uh, um, what do you call yeah. it, uh, Rich? Yeah, I've got my uh. Help me, uh, Rich. <laughs> yeah, Help I've got it hooked up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I've got, uh, I hooked up an Arduino to the uh, um, the Azel, uh the three-axis uh, antenna yeah. Yeah. Uh, controller. So and it worked got, well. So that you, you, you need to do a little bit of diddling with the Arduino to get it to drive these two steppers. And yeah. Bob's your uncle. I, I yeah, think I think, it's, uh, I think it'll make a big, a big effect for a very, very low cost. Don, which QST? And was there three November? It's required? November. It's November's QST. Here's the page. And maybe three D uh, printing was needed or not? No, no, no. no I don't think okay. so. Um, it's got a stingray. It, what it's using is these um, Go Builder um, things that you use for making robotics and that kind of thing. They're pre-made. I don't know if that's exactly the one or not, but it sure looks like it. Um, anyway, the uh, QST, I think you can look online if you're a member i don't know if you're not a member how you might look at it but i think you might find it you mean in the 2023 edition of Q 2023 S november yeah in fact i just got it here uh three or four weeks ago and it's page 30 and it it what struck me was it looked very much like the uh, image they have on the on the crowd supply Uh, you have to look. It's the uh, Stingray Servo, Stingray-4 and Stingray-9. What those are, I don't know. I haven't I haven't done much with servos, but it sounds like uh, it'll work. The dish looks a little like my mother's colander, uh, but uh, it ought to work fine. This is the secret to it. It's that Corvo. Uh, Q U R R V O amplifier, low noise amplifier, and th those uh, art don't those uh, doesn't that uh, back plane look a little familiar? Yeah, sure does. So anyway, I this is sort of very I interesting. Might I, I might I might also comment that the crack 
crack and SDR people have uh, a um, a five channel uh, SDR radio, which essentially has five SDR radios in it on one board that are synced together, and uh, that uh, can be really useful if you're if you're doing uh, uh, this uh, uh, in, in interferometry. Uh, you can actually uh, run the antennas through the uh, S through separate SDRs and have everything synced so that uh, so that the timing uh, so there's no timing problems because because there are uh, five equivalent radios right on one board with the, running off of the same uh, local oscillator. Thank you, Ed. This is fun stuff. Uh, we, the problem is we have to wait till, well, I guess 2024 isn't that long away now. That's good. Well, speaking of ARRL, ARRL, uh, the antenna book is out. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, the authors, the authors from Sarah actually got paid for, uh, for the little bit they wrote. Um, and uh, are going to get a free uh, free volume. So um, we have not been asked to go update this one yet, but uh, we may get into the engineering book too. Uh, but we're going to have to we'd have to do another uh, writing campaign like we did last year. I realize it took a year from when we started this to when the book came out. So it's not a short process, but. Um, uh, I think we got it all worked out. And uh, so, uh, yeah, you're at, uh, start looking for your ARRL. It's uh, on Amazon now, uh, the antenna book, the new one. And uh, we got a whole section just for uh, radio astronomy antennas. Okay. And I haven't seen it yet. So uh, I haven't got my copy yet. So uh, I'm waiting for that. Okay. Um, Ed, this is really good stuff. Makes me want to go get two or three of them just for uh, interferometry. Okay, uh, let's see. Anybody left? I think we got everybody. Anybody not? Chris Webb. Hi there. Um, I'm new to, to the uh, radio astronomy group and uh, um, just starting out with. Uh, I bought a Super SID and a uh, scope in the box. I've put together my scope in the box, but uh, I'm going to mount the um, the telescope to a uh, a Los Mandy plate so I can mount it to a uh, an Altaz uh, uh, mount that I have for visual tripod or visual telescopes, um, just so I can control the elevation pretty easily. Um, and uh so hopefully in the next couple of weeks i'll be setting that up um and uh currently have the stuff to put together the antenna for the super sid but uh been um mainly focusing on uh i, I basically am uh, decided to try and learn uh, the sample acquisition side of the super sid so i'm uh porting the um the application from uh, Python or the sampling side of the application for Python to Rust uh, just for a fun little exercise and uh, uh, I've got it mostly working um, uh, although uh, what I'm seeing I'm not sure if it's the effect of the way that I'm uh, um, uh, taking the data from the sound card or if it's uh, that the actual data itself coming from the the the, the sound card uh, that I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing a basically a sine wave out, out of the output and reading it in the input, and I'm seeing uh, what what is confusing to me when I when I put a direct sine or uh, generate the direct sine wave and, and analyze it with my uh, the you know the Welch the whatever get the spectrum and and actually view it um, that comes out correctly, but when I uh, instead take that sine wave out, put it out the sound card and then read it back in and then put it through the, uh, the, the Welch spectrum, uh, algorithm. That's when I get kind of confusing results. So I'm 
trying to diagnose whether it's the uh, my on my side the actual data processing or if it's th just the fact that I'm sending it you know a, a an analog signal digitizing it going pulling it back to analog and then sending it to the spectrum so um, fun fun stuff basically but uh, starting my journey and uh, really excited to be a part of the society. That's it for me. Right. <clears throat> and we got, uh, um, let's see, Jonathan Penegale is our uh, the guy who manufactures the uh, super SIDs for us. He gets all the parts, puts them together, and ships them when they're ordered. So uh, any questions about the uh, how it works and things like that, he might be the right guy to do that. Um, just uh, go to the super SID uh, email address uh, and uh, or the SID, SID at radioastronomy.org. Um, and uh, he probably answer you. Um, okay, perfect. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, okay. I think I got everybody. Uh, Rich, I got one more thing. I left. Uh, I left on the, uh, on the, uh, oh, come on. Uh, on the chat. Um, an outfit called U.S. Digital makes a 3600 count per revolution optical encoder and uh it's pretty cost effective i think it's around a hundred dollars a piece but uh it's extremely well made you can order it even if you want with a ball bearing on it for very little increase in cost very very little increase in cost um and uh, i've worked with those with their uh, encoders for a long time. They're very stout, very well-made and very professional. And uh, you can order it online. There it is. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, if you go to the site, um, you can set it up the way you want it. Uh, it also has an index pulse that you can use to do a a go-to for uh, any purpose you'd like. There it is. Um, so I, I just thought I'd throw it out there. I've got a couple of them that I'm working with now to put on my large dish, which is creaking its way toward actually seeing first light. Okay, thanks. Yep. I want, I want to bring up something else too I forgot to mention. Uh, I was at the AMSAT meeting, the satellite meeting recently, and Frank Bauer gave a presentation. He's an old NASA guy that's been working with AMSAT for a long time about uh, transmissions on the moon in case somebody gets uh, ambitious and wants to do something there. But they're trying to protect the essentially the far side of the moon uh, for radio astronomy and uh, people internationally are coordinating the frequencies that can be used on the satellites and ground stations that are going to be used on the moon to try to do that protection. And they're limiting the transmissions to above two gig on the radio equipment <laughs> that's used. And uh, there are a couple of missions that have recently been launched that are going to orbit the moon or land on the moon that are using frequencies below those frequencies, but they are uh, working to get that coordinated and he's attending the meetings and things and uh, working with people about that so I was pretty interested when I heard that uh, that presentation he made you can probably find it on the AMSAT uh, website uh, the, the presentations were recorded and you can probably find his presentation there all right I have a couple slides for Nathan Go ahead, Alex. If I may. Okay, so hopefully that's what your, uh, your nano VNA will look like. Um, I typically tune it a little high. When you mount it on the dish, I find it drops down uh, a couple megahertz. But uh, this is the dish uh, or the loop feed. It tunes up very nicely. 
and and I use it on my radio telescope. It works. And they have they have told you incorrectly. It looks like the uh, the feed is in line with the uh, the wide part of the uh, of the reflector. And so what I have done, I, well, you probably have seen it. I added side panels on here. It creates a deeper dish. It reduces the pickup of ground noise. And then this is overlaid with some thin aluminum uh, mesh. And it works. It works very well. So Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that it? Yeah, okay. Well, Oh, go ahead. I got a couple of uh, comments there that uh, you know, played around with the 20 megahertz and looking at uh, you know, for solar flares, found that I have some uh, uh, really nice uh, LED shop lights. They look like fluorescent tubes and they're really strings of LEDs inside there. They're a really nice light source to work with. Unfortunately, they put out a lot of garbage at 20 megahertz. And I've been putting RFI filters, just the block filters that are yeah, 120 volts in, 120 volts out. Put those on there and a three prong power plug, and they go from uh, you know blasting away to uh, you can't tell they're on from that. So so far I've done four of those lights. I got a, a few more around here, but uh, the number of things that make interference at 20 megahertz is is amazing. Uh, other comment I want to make unrelated is that the uh, uh, people that are on the board, I would like to speak with you for about uh, three minutes after this meeting is over, if that's possible, Rich. Okay. Does everybody else stay on? I'll turn off the record and everything. Well, yeah, Jansky had trouble at 20 megahertz, too, with Model Ts. So technology marches. Different. Uh, the, noise, the noisiest one was current one was the Volks, the old Volkswagen Beetle. Is that because it just sparked all the time? And just I have no idea noise. why it, it just oh, but was, it was noisy. apparently. All right. Uh, do the new bo new Beetles change that? Yes. The Super Beetles and stuff? Okay, thanks. Especially the diesel. <laughs> okay. All right. Going, going, gone. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, see you in two weeks for the uh, Drake's Lounge.